Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. So, uh, last week in our last workshop, what we did was we did a really basic uh, introduction to 3D modeling in Blender, where we made a pencil by starting with some uh, cylinders and then using some of the basic extrude and scale and move tools just to turn our cylinders into the pencil stick, the tip, the, the cap, and the rubber uh, eraser at the very end. And at the end of our class, we did some really quick and basic introductions to applying materials to different parts of our objects to give it a kind of quick uh, pencil look. Continuing on from the end of last week, what we're going to do is go a little bit more in-depth on the subject of materials, uh, lighting, and rendering in Blender. Now, this is going to be a super basic introductory overview, because rendering in any software, but in, in advanced VFX software like Blender or Maya or Max or anything like that in particular, uh, it can be a big, deep rabbit hole of best practices and people's opinions on settings and how to tweak things for performance or tweak things for realism or special effects or we're going to avoid all of that stuff. This is going to be a really broad introductory overview to um, the render engines in Blender, the lighting options in Blender, the materials in Blender, and um, just to give people who are completely new a, an idea of what tools and what options are available just to get started. Um, we're not going to go into like super advanced nitty gritty depth on this stuff. Um, so to get started, uh, if we go over to the right hand side to our properties panel, uh, we can go to this one that looks like a little DSLR camera. It's called render properties. And if we go in here, we can see that under render engines, we have three render engines in Blender by default. So out of the box, there are three render engines in Blender, but we can um, add more to Blender with add-ons. So there's like Lux Render or Render Man, a few others. Um, we're not going to go into those because, again, advanced stuff. We're just going to focus on, you, you know, you've just installed Blender. What does it come with out of the box? Um, so the three that come out of the box with Blender are Eevee, Workbench, and Cycles. Eevee and Cycles we're going to cover later in the class because they kind of go hand in hand. They both use a PBR shading model and their materials are fairly interchangeable. Um, so we're going to start off with Workbench. Um, and actually Workbench is what you're seeing in the viewport right now. So Workbench is what you're probably going to be seeing in the viewport most of the time um, because it is the quickest uh, and most lightweight render uh, engine in Blender used for previewing your models as you're setting up your scene, as you're sculpting and modeling, um, just so you have like the lowest performance impact in the viewport as you work on your models. Um, if we go to the bottom right of our 3D viewport, um, we introduced this in some of the last classes, but you have four render modes in the viewport by default. So you have wireframe, you have solid view, you have material view, and then you have rendered view. Um, the wireframe is good for obviously get, getting an idea of like the actual topology of your objects. Um, and if you've got your x-ray mode enabled here, you can actually see through into the other objects. It can be useful for kind of seeing through your scene. Um, so that can be helpful. Um, in solid view, you can also uh, turn on your x-ray view with this little uh, square within a square uh, button and get kind of a translucent look at your scene uh, without having to go into like the wireframe view, which can sometimes, uh, because you lose the shading, it can kind of flatten everything in your scene out, make it hard to tell the shapes and contours of your objects. Um, so turning on X-ray and solid view can be more helpful um, as of Blender 2.8. Um, but the solid view is where we're, where the um, workbench render engine is used. In material preview, the EV render engine is used because it's a really lightweight, quick render engine, which is good for getting an approximation of the materials that are applied to your objects in your scene. And then in the final render mode, your rendered view, your rendered view will use whatever your uh, render engine is set to at that time. So if you had uh, EV as your output render engine, when you switch from material preview to rendered view, you'd still be using EV, but it would turn on a couple of extra features. It would turn on your world, um, your scene lights. It would turn on your world lighting, um, which are usually disabled by default in the material preview just to save on um, render speed. 
Um, but if you had cycles, then it would be using cycles and do some path tracing in the viewport. Again, we'll get into those later. Right now we're focusing on Workbench in the solid view mode. So, turning on our settings here. Our settings um, up at the top, we start off with lighting. There is studio, matte cap, and flat shading modes in, in the uh, viewport shading models here. So flat shading... Um, kind of does what it says. It removes all of the, the uh, lighting and makes everything completely and utterly flat. No shadows, no shading, no reflections, no nothing, just flat colors. Um, this is not the most useful rendering mode um, because obviously you lose a lot of visual information about the contours of your objects, but it can be useful especially for um, character modelers or um, environment prop modelers to get an idea of the silhouette of your objects. So going back to a lot of your um, your fundamentals of art, your, your basic principles of art, um, positive and negative space and silhouette are really important for um, visually defining uh, objects in your scene. So the flat shaded view mode can be really useful for telling uh, for getting an idea, getting rid of all the distractions of the lighting and the shadows and the shading and just focusing on your silhouettes to see how well they read um, at a glance without any of that extra, you know, distracting information. Obviously, this isn't a view mode that you use a lot of the time, but it's useful to have it there toggled in and out of it, just get an idea of your contours and your silhouette. Um, going back to studio shading mode, studio shading applies fake lighting to your objects, which is uh, camera orientated. So if I start to rotate my camera around, you'll notice that from this angle, um, we kind of have a shadow behind Suzanne's eyes here and a highlight up at the front. And as we rotate the camera, that shadow kind of retreats back to the backside behind the uh, eyebrow there. The lighting kind of moves with the camera to the front of the head there. As I keep rotating, those shadows keep moving behind Suzanne with the light at the front. So the lighting is always oriented to the camera. Um, and if I go to my options here, you can see that the reason that the shadows are on the back side and the lighting's on the front side is because our lights are set up where you can see there's a little bit of lighting on the front and shadows on like the back side. Um, there are a handful of preset studio lighting modes or studio lighting setups um, in Blender. Um, that you can pick and choose between depending on, you know, what you think looks good and what emphasizes the contours of your objects better. Um, so these can be useful for different things like that one where the lights are from the side can really kind of uh, highlight and emphasize the silhouette and the edge contours of your objects. Um, whereas some of these other three point lighting modes are more useful for seeing the contours from the front. Um, and you can actually create your own custom studio lighting setups. So if we go over to our file, or I'm sorry, to our edit preferences under lights, you can actually open up the editor and edit these lights and set up your own three or four point lighting system, uh, change the ambient lighting and save it as your own uh, lighting preset. Um, additionally, you can install matte caps and HDRIs on top of the ones that come out of the box in Blender. Again, we'll get to those momentarily, but um, you are not limited by just the default presets inside of, of Blender. You can uh, add to them um, as, as needed, um, depending on, on what you think is most useful for your workflow. So that's studio lighting. Studio lighting just applies some fake lights in the scene. So you set up uh, like your own custom three-point lighting or use one of these default like three-point lighting setups just to get an idea of the contours of your objects. The next tab over is matte cap. And matte cap stands for material capture. And this is a slightly more advanced shader, um, which as it sounds like is a capture of a real world material. Um, these are more interoperable between um, softwares these days. So um, matte caps are used in Blender. They're also used in 3ds Max and Maya. They're used in uh, Sketchfab and ZBrush. Um, and the benefit of a matte cap versus the studio lighting, the studio lighting is uh, entirely in Blender, customizable. You're you know setting up those fake lights in your preferences. A matte cap actually is a like a snapshot of a material in a specific scene with a specific lighting scenario. So if I go over to like this, uh, red one here. Um, this is like an anodized aluminium or maybe like a car paint material. Um, and you can kind of see in the reflection here that um, they were using a, a, a 
octagonal uh, studio umbrella light when they captured this surface, and it looks like there's kind of a checker grid um, floor underneath that it's also reflecting in this material. Um, and then as we go down, we could go to like this gray one, and you can see like there's some windows and reflections in this. This might be like a, a room interior um, captured with like a really shiny porcelain or something. Um, and some of these other ones, like you get this like weird uh, anisotropic like brushed metal effect. Um, and, and different, and that's like a cartoony shader. Different matte caps are useful for different things. Um, the really shiny ones I find are super useful for really getting a, a really strong idea of the, um, the contours and where you might have pinching and stretching on your model. So Suzanne here is fairly um, smooth over, overall. There's not a ton of, of pinching and stretching that we need to worry about um, with Suzanne. But um, you can see here, like this, this shiny reflection shows us there's like, she has a little dimple in her temple here which in some of the more flat shaded modes you might struggle to notice. Um, so the matte caps I find to be really useful for picking out different properties of your surface that even studio lighting might, um, might make it hard to notice. Um, some of these weird ones like these vertical or horizontal stripes can really give you an idea of the contours and where the, like, the corners and curvature on your object is. Um, but knowing you have these available to you and that you can install custom ones if you find ones that you like on the internet or make your own, um, it, it is good to have these tools available to you and know that they are options that you have. Um, now, as you can see, all the colors of our Suzanne heads in our scene um, are different. So underneath our studio and matcap lighting, we have the colors section. And right now I have it set to random. And what random does is basically what it says. Each object in our scene is assigned a randomized color, and this can be super useful when you're working on big projects with lots of objects in the scene, instead of, you know, having to by hand make every single object a separate color by changing its settings. It will just randomize colors for all of the objects and help, uh, help you at a glance differentiate and break up and see which objects are where. Um, the color is determined by the name. So if we were to change the name of Suzanne here to Monkey or Moki, because I can't spell, um, the color changed a little bit there. Let me change it to something really different. Just randomly type on my keyboard and you can get a good pop preview there. So we went from like a light purple or a light blue to like a pinkish color. If I change this to like Jeff, then it turned into like a teal color. So it's using the name of the object as like the seed to generate the randomized colors. Um, We'll change your name back to Suze for Suzanne. Um, if instead you wanted to manually assign colors to different objects, you have a few different options. So uh, you have material, object, single, and texture. Single will apply a singular color to all of your objects in the scene. So by default, it's like this white color. I could change this to red. Everything becomes red. Everything becomes green. Um, the single mode I don't find to be super useful because it means that um, depending on, on the complexity of your scene, everything can really quickly start blurring together into a haze of singular colors, and it just, it doesn't help everything stand out from one another, it doesn't help you navigate your scene efficiently. Um, perhaps some people prefer it, I really don't like single, I like random, or object and material where I set them by hand. Material uh, allows you to change under materials, so in our properties, this little, like, red grid bubble icon is our materials. And you can see that our surface material is orange, but our material in the viewport is blue. Um, I did this intentionally to show that, in fact, your viewport display can be set to whatever color you want, and that color can arbitrarily, if you decide, be a different color than the actual color of the object. Um, so if for some reason you were trying to organize objects in your scene by material using uh, a color coding scheme. So all the blue stuff is metal and all the uh, red stuff is rubber and all the, the green stuff is, is a plexiglass. You could do that and make the um, viewport display a really bold color separately entirely from your actual surface color when you go to render it in your final um, animation or your final still image. Um, additionally, you can go to object and use object colors. 
our object colors have nothing to do with our materials and are actually assigned per object. So if we go over here to this one that looks like um, a filled in square with like a little square um, reticle surrounding it, um, our object properties. Down under viewport display, you can see that the color for the viewport display can be set per object. Um, to make this a little bit more clear, if I were to duplicate Suzanne here, our materials, you can see there are two objects sharing this material. They are both using the same material. So if I were to go to material shading mode, you can see that they are both sharing the same material. They are both sh sharing the same material color. However, because these are separate objects, when I go to object shading mode, I could change just the second duplicate of Suzanne to a different color. So you can have two objects that say, uh, share the same material, share the same material colors, um, but have different object colors to differentiate them. Um, the situations where this might come up are a little bit um, like niche and nuance, but it's useful to have it. Uh, if you need it, you have it. So we have material, we have object, we have vertex color. Vertex color is assigned from our vertex paint mode. Um, vertex painting is kind of a niche uh, tool. You don't use it a lot of the time. Um, for the most part, I use vertex paint to create um, material ID masks, which I will then bake out and use in, uh, like for Substance Painter, to quickly assign masked uh, areas of my model to different materials. Um, but if you are using vertex painting for whatever purpose that you're using it for, um, it's good to know that in your solid shading mode, you can actually preview those vertex colors without having to constantly switch out of object mode back to vertex paint mode in order to see that. Um, and then you have texture view. Texture view will actually let you see whatever texture you have selected in your shaders. So in our shaders, I'm going to go ahead and hover into the corner and break off a new window in our viewport and set this to our shader editor. And you can see that I have a couple of textures actually assigned to this Suzanne. Um, and so if I start plugging these in, oops, plug these in, you can see that I can switch back and forth and it will show me the textures that are assigned to Suzanne at the time. So if you don't want to switch to your full material preview, because material preview can be exceptionally slow at times, uh, depending on the power of your hardware and how many textures and things have to be loaded into your scene. Um, you can get a quick preview of just your like UV unwrapping by using the texture shading or your texture color mode in your viewport shading. Um, so yeah, super useful to know. I'm going to go ahead and go back to random just to uh, go back to our like basic preview. Random is what I prefer for most of the time. So below that, we have this option called backface culling. So backface culling, um, we introduced this a little bit in the last class, but a, uh, a face for an object in Blender has an orientation. It has a normal. And that orientation, that normal direction, tells you which is the outside of the object and which is the inside of the object. Um, backface culling, basically, as I rotate you can see the, the floor plane that I've got selected here is visible from the top, but invisible from the bottom. If I turn off backface culling, it will become visible. The backface culling is basically a performance saving option, um, which is turned on by default in most uh, like video game engines and stuff. Um, sometimes you'll notice that if you clip through objects, you can kind of see through the world um, because backface culling is usually enabled by default. Um, it's just a quick way to, to save on rendering performance by not having to render every face as two-sided faces because um, it basically doubles the rendering performance because it's treating each face as if it's two faces pointing um, with their normals in two different directions. Um, I like to keep back face and calling enabled most of the time. Um, a, because if I were to export this object to a game engine, then I would know... Um, I would know that my normals are oriented in the right direction, that it's not going to create any lighting errors or, you know, one-sided invisibility errors. Um, the other reason I like to have backface culling enabled is if I'm to if I'm designing something that's meant to be 3D printed, um, you need a a 3D printed model needs to be manifold, meaning there are no holes or gaps in the surface. Uh, 
and it needs the normals to be pointing in the correct direction for the slicer to know which is the inside of the object and which is the outside of the object. So it knows, you know, the volume of space that it's then having to slice and turn into a 3D printed plastic extrusion. Um, so having backface calling enabled allows you to very quickly and easily see if your object is inside out or if there are any cracks and gaps in your surfaces. Um, so I pretty much have that enabled by default all the time. Hmm. Next up is the X-ray setting. The X-ray setting is um, basically the opacity for your X-ray mode. So if I turn on X-ray mode, you can see we get that translucent uh, see-through effect. If I turn the opacity slider for this up and down, I can turn it all the way up, at which point it is basically disabled. Like, it's not... there's no translucency, there's no opacity, so it's as if you didn't have X-ray enabled at all. Um, I don't know why you would do that, but you can. <clears throat> and then as you... Um, excuse me, taking a sip of water there. Uh, and then as you turn the slider down, you can make them less and less opaque, more and more transparent. Um, so can be useful depending on, you know, how see-through you want things to be in your scene. By default, it's set to half, so it turns the transparency down by half. Uh, then you have shadows, so you can enable shadows. Um, I tend not to have the shadows turned on, one, because they can be a little bit unsightly when you're trying to preview a scene, and two, because they are based on your studio lighting, or like the world lighting, not on the actual lights in your scene. It's a fake light. So if I were to go to my uh, rendered mode, you can see the lights here are not pointing at all the same way. Um, so I have two point lights in my scene, and the shadows are basically pointing backwards. Whereas if I go to my viewport shading, you can see there's not light, there's not shadows from two points of light. It's just you know, as I move the lights around, it doesn't matter. It's just applying light at a 45 degree angle from somewhere. Now you can change that. I can change the light direction in here by rotating this little ball around. So I clicked the little settings cog and moved it. So I could set the light, the shadows rather, to point in any direction separately from our studio lighting. But yeah, I, I tend to find this a little bit more like confusing and distracting than anything because those shadows don't align with anything else in our 3D view um, and are completely fake and arbitrary. So um, yeah, it's it's available. Um, the slider lets you change the opacity of those shadows, but I, I tend to find them more distracting than useful. However, cavity, the next one, is super useful. So if you are familiar with... Uh, ambient occlusion settings in video games. Cavity is essentially an ambient occlusion setting. What it does is add um, contact lighting and contact shadows to your raised and recessed edges in your model, in your uh, uh, viewport, rather. So if I go to the uh, settings option here, I can change the distance to make, it lar make the effect larger or smaller. I'm actually going to turn the distance down a little bit um, because the objects that I have here are kind of small. These are, in Blender units, these are about the size of like a mug or a, um, a teapot, not human-sized or not building-sized, so the contact shadows need to be a little bit smaller for this scene. Um, but as I turn on, on and off our cavity, the valley is adding shadows to the recesses, the ridge is adding highlights to our sharp raised edges. Um, so this is super useful for getting like an extra emphasized view of the um, contours and recesses on your models. And I turn Cavity on by default pretty much in every project I'm working on because it really, it gives a really bright, distinctive view at a glance of the actual shapes and forms of your objects in your scene and helps them um, with that like blobby shadow surrounding them, helps them pop from other objects in the scene. Obviously, it is nowhere near realistic, um, but the solid workbench view modes are not meant to be realistic. They're meant to be convenient for navigating your scene efficiently and quickly and, and differentiating objects. So, uh, type here is important for our cavity view, for our cavity. So, under type, there's world, screen, and both. World means that the size setting, the distance setting that we were changing earlier, stays consistent no matter how zoomed or not zoomed I am. So you can see here, the shadow underneath Suzanne's head will stay 
relatively the same size no matter how much I zoom in and out. The shadow remains consistent. However, if I change this to screen mode, that shadow is going to be dependent on the screen or on how how many pixels on the screen the size of the object is. I'm actually going to collapse our shaders quickly so we can um, shader editor hang on a second I'm going to disconnect that one then I'm going to collapse our shader editor just to give us more room in our uh, in our viewport here so I have it set to screen type at the moment I'm going to turn these sliders up to really emphasize things um, and then as I zoom in and out you'll notice that the effect becomes bigger and smaller. So here, as I'm zoomed way in, the highlights are really subtle, the shadows being applied by cavity are really subtle. They're still there. If I toggle it on and off, they're still there. But then as I zoom out, you'll notice that her eyebrows become way brighter than as I zoom in. The shadows in her ears become way darker and wider than when I zoom in. Um, and this can become a little bit confusing and distracting at times. Um, because it's based on, you know, the resolution of your screen, the zoom level of, of where you are in your scene. Um, it's a little bit arbitrary feeling. Um, so I prefer to have it set to world or set it to both and turn both of the settings up. So they sort of um, add both the effects on top of each other and create like a super heavy effect, um, which really highlights and emphasizes the contours and forms of our objects in the scene. Um, so I find that setting really useful for really making everything in our scene pop and to really see the contours of our, of our objects. Um, the depth of field option here is only useful if we have a camera and we're looking through the camera. Um, it gives us like a fake approximation of what our um, camera depth of field is. So like the blur you have when your camera's out of focus can be useful. Um, more useful, I guess, in animations when you're trying to like preview your um, depth of field, but the depth of field there is separate from the ones in like EV and cycles. So if you want to like get an idea of what your camera really is going to look like in your final render, I would recommend going over to your rendered mode, which again we'll cover uh, a little bit later on. Uh, and then we have our outline here, which is kind of subtle and hard to see. It's kind of a fake outline around the edges of our object. If I turn up the uh, the value here you can kind of see going from like a dark black to a bright white that little like highlighted edge that's applied um, again it can be useful to kind of help objects pop out from each other if you're navigating a really densely complicated scene um, but I find it a little bit distracting um, so you know depends on what you need what you want um, I tend not to use it or if I have it it's turned to black which I find to be a little bit more subtle um, and look more like a shadow than like a bright in your, in your face highlight. Um, and then specular lighting, lighting just adds like a little bit of shininess and reflectivity to the surface in addition to the studio lighting. So you can kind of see on their foreheads there, they kind of look shiny, like a slightly shiny plastic. Um, can be useful, depends on your taste. Um, I tend not to use it just because it gets a little distracting. Um, again, it turn the settings on per your taste. Um, I tend not to use it because it's a little bit of extra performance and then if I'm using matte caps, which I'm usually using matte caps, um, the matte cap is going to define my reflections more than adding another level of specular reflection on top of it. So those are our workbench settings. Um, those are everything you need to know about workbench. Um, it is basically just used for sculpting, modeling, editing, um, really quick and lightweight for not seeing your final materials, but just, you know, getting an idea of your shapes and forms inside the viewport. Excuse me while I take a sip of water. <clears throat> so then we're going to go over to our material preview and material preview is going to be using EV. Uh, EV versus cycles, um, just to give a quick brief overview before we dive into their settings in the next section. EV is a lightweight rasterization render engine, uh, which is you can think of essentially like a video game engine, which uh, applies quick, fake, approximated lighting, um, which is not as photorealistic as true path tracing, like 
Cycles does. It is really good for people to who are on low-end computers who can't um, who find the number of minutes or hours it may take to render a good quality image out of Cycles too much for them, um, especially if you're trying to do animations. Um, Eevee is also really useful for doing um, previews, like if you're an animator and you want to render a quick preview before doing your final full quality render in Cycles, you can do a quick one, a quick previs in Eevee, and then do your final render in Cycles once you've got um, you know, approval on that animation in terms of like your timing and your camera angles and your lighting and all that stuff. Um, there are downsides to Eevee. Eevee is definitely not a replacement for Cycles. Um, a lot of people will use it as a replacement for Cycles because they can't really tell the difference, but there are deficiencies um, doing rasterization versus Cycles full-on rendering, which we'll get to um, momentarily. So our material preview here, separately from our render view, um, there's a few options, scene lights, scene world, and then world settings. So if I turn on scene lights, you'll notice that suddenly I get the lighting from these two lamps, and as I move them around, I get the shadows from those lamps. Um, by default, it doesn't use scene lights. It uses like a fake ambient lighting um, from the world. Now, the scene world, if I turn it on, in this case, my world, if I go to this like little globe looking icon, is a gray background. I could apply an environment map to the background similar to what um, we have here, but right now, and by default, Blender will have just a flat color in the background. It won't try to apply an environment map to the background. So this world here, as we zoom into our objects, um, into our materials, you can see that I have reflections here where you can kind of see the sun, you can kind of see the trees and the sky. Um, this environment is like a park. Out of the box, Blender comes with a few different environments. So there's this one that looks like a little car park, like parking spaces. So if we go over to like one of the really shiny metals over here, you can kind of see uh, in, you got skyscrapers. It looks like we're on like the rooftop of a, um, a multi-story car park. So you got this lot, the, um, the parking space lines there painted on the road. You've got like a building under construction here with a crane, the sun obviously over there, sky. These uh, environments that come out of the box with Blender are HDRI environment maps. An HDRI environment map is essentially a 360 image capture of a real world environment with a high dynamic range. That's what HDR, or HDR stands for, high dynamic range. Um, if you are unfamiliar with dynamic range, um, from you don't have like a photography background, you don't know what that means. The dynamic range of a render or of a camera is the difference between the darkest dark in your scene and the lightest light in your scene. Um, so if you've ever taken a photo on a uh, on a, a cell phone camera, you'll know that a cell phone camera has generally a very low dynamic range, which means that if you are in bright sunlight and you have dark shadows, you'll notice that either the bright sunlight will become blown out really, really quickly, or your shadows will become really, really dark and murky really, really quickly, because the camera can't handle such a giant difference between super bright sunlight and super dark shadows. Um, generally, a phone has about 10 stops of dynamic range, whereas a cinema camera, like a RED camera or a Blackmagic camera or an RE camera, might have something closer to like uh, 13, 14, 15 stops of dynamic range, and a stop or an EV of dynamic range is a doubling in the uh, light intensity, a doubling in the difference between the brightest bright and the darkest dark that a camera can resolve um, perfectly. So the a high dynamic range image, an HDR image, stores um, the information for the lighting usually in 16-bit or 32-bit formats, so they have a lot more information regarding the lighting versus like a JPEG, which is usually 8-bit and a crushed dynamic range. Um, and an HDR image has to be captured such that there is that large dynamic range in the image, so it's not clipped and crushed like a, a cell phone camera. So I'm gonna pull in a window from my other screen this is HDRI Haven. HDRI Haven is a website 
uh, run by a Blender artist named Greg Zoll, um, and he's the one who donated the uh, HDR environment maps, which are included in Blender by default. These are from HDRI Haven, um, and his website actually provides free HDR environment maps for people to use um, because it's Patreon that supports him going out and capturing these uh, environment maps. And so if you are trying to set up realistic lighting in your scenes, uh, you want to get real light, real reflections, like, you know, um, you want to get real sunlight, real reflections from the environment without having to, you know, a model an entire city park or an entire skyscraper or an entire parking lot. HDRs are super, super good for getting that realistic lighting and reflections in your scene. Um, so I recommend wholeheartedly HDRI Haven for getting these. Um, but that's basically what an HDR is, what an environment map is, and what is um, applied by default in the material preview. If you're ever wondering why you switch to material preview and it suddenly looks like you have a lot more world in your scene than you think that you actually have modeled in your empty scene, um, that's the reason why. Um, and obviously in here you can go ahead and rotate that environment map, you can change the brightness of that environment map, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll go ahead now, uh, I'll take this opportunity to switch my render settings, my render engine to Eevee, and then I can toggle and change some of these settings while we're in Eevee, um, so we can change it in our material preview, because material preview uses Eevee. So, in Eevee, we have a handful of settings to change the, uh, look of our scene. So Eevee by default, if we turn everything off, um, looks fairly flat because there are no shadows, there are no, um, like, the reflections aren't dynamic, you can't, like, you can't see the yellow, uh, Suzanne in the reflection of the green Suzanne or in the blue Suzanne. Um, the reflections don't reflect other things in the scene. Um, for a raster engine, like a game engine, until you apply a bunch of post-processing effects, which are what these options in the render settings are, are essentially post-processing effects that are applied on top of your rendered image in EV. Until you apply a post-processing effect, the lighting in a rasterization engine doesn't take into account anything else in the scene. It renders every um, face and every object in the scene in isolation from one another, which is why EV and any game engine is far less realistic than a true path tracing engine, which will simulate photons bouncing around the scene and the way that light actually reflects and scatters and interacts with objects in the real world. Um, you can do a lot of clever things, and video games have gotten really good at inventing clever ways to add fake extra information to the lighting to make it look as if light is actually interacting between objects, but it never actually is, and that's how you get away with rendering something at, you know, 60 plus frames a second in a game, or rendering in a handful of seconds in Eevee, versus, um, you know, offline VFX Hollywood stuff, which takes minutes or hours or days of render time per frame to get a super true-to-life realistic image. So, uh, the first setting is ambient occlusion, and as we mentioned with the cavity map, ambient occlusion is like a fake contact shadow which finds like the areas where light would, um, the recesses where light wouldn't be able to reach easily, um, and adds extra shadowing to those areas. So in our settings here, we've got precision here, which kind of um, is kind of a performance feature. How precise is this tracing into your scene? Um, you have factor, which is basically opacity for the effect, and then a distance, which similar to the cavity distance is just saying how wide the effect should be applied. Now, as I turn this up, you can see one of the issues with EV being a rasterization engine versus a true ray tracing engine. You can see that as I turn the distance up for my ambient occlusion, suddenly we get these weird shadows behind Suzanne that don't make a ton of sense. The reason for this is because we are not actually bouncing light around the scene. We're not simulating photons actually bouncing around. From the camera's view here, Suzanne could be extending infinitely beyond the camera into infinity um, and might pass through the floor. We don't know. 
um, because we don't have any information about light hitting the ground and seeing that, oh no, the bottom of, of Suzanne is, you know, round and hollow and, and off the floor. From this perspective, the shadows are applied as if Suzanne extended further because we don't know. We don't know how anything about the backside of Suzanne. Um, and so that's one of the weird issues with um, applying ambient occlusion um, in a rasterization engine is you only get information in screen space. And this becomes even more apparent if we go ahead and we turn on, I'll turn this down so it's a little less obnoxious, if we turn on screen space reflections. So screen space reflections is a fairly modern um, technique for faking um, uh, interactive reflections between objects using only information that we get from our screen. So one of the confusions that people tend to have if they're completely new to Eevee is they think that because there's a sampling option in Eevee, it must be doing ray tracing the same way that sampling uh, changes the, the number of rays that are traced in cycles. This is not the case. Um, screen space reflections, ambient occlusion, shadows, the sampling setting for, for those involves a technique called ray marching. Um, and what ray marching is doing is using a depth pass from the camera to then kind of do a quick and dirty fake ray tracing-ish effect using only information from what the camera captured to that frame. It knows nothing about any actual um, light bounces in the scene or anything beyond the camera. So we can kind of see this here. Um, if I zoom out, you can see that the orange monkey shows up in the reflections of the blue monkey. But as I turn the camera and move the orange monkey outside of the view, we lose that orange monkey. But then as we zoom out and we get the screen back in, you can see there's the orange monkey. But then we lose the orange monkey. Um, yeah, it can be a little weird. It'll get easier. To, it's even easier to see, rather, if I change the ground to be metallic and really mirror-like. That gives a really good idea of the weird way that screen space reflections don't quite work. So in reality, what we would expect is for the bottom of the monkey to reflect the bottom of the monkey. But we can't see the bottom of Suzanne from this camera perspective, so everything gets stretched and distorted. Um, and as you reach the edges of the screen, you can see here that the rest of this monkey is outside of the screen, so it's fading the effect off at the edges of our screen. Um, and so you lose reflections from things that are off camera, um, which is obviously completely unrealistic because in the real world, light wouldn't care about which way the camera is facing. Light will bounce and scatter through everywhere all the time, constantly, because that's how physics works. Um, but that's one of the downsides of screen space uh, techniques. Um, and if I turn the roughness up here, you can see how noisy uh, it gets. As I mentioned, uh, screen space reflections are doing kind of a fake ray tracing-ish effect called ray marching. Um, and so the sampling in EV turns up the number of ray march steps that are done to this fake technique. It's not ray tracing, but it's doing this ray marching fake technique. And so the sampling um, does actually improve the final look by um, adding more samples, adding more information um, to make it smoother and even out the averages of like this Gaussian um, blurred interaction of the reflection here. Um, but obviously, as you turn up the number of samples, uh, your performance will take a hit um, at the same time. Um, generally speaking, EV will always perform better than cycles, um, but depending on how low-end your hardware is, those those sample counts may become heavier and heavier over time. And maybe maybe you don't want to turn the samples up too high because maybe your computer, like if it's a if it's a low-end laptop, maybe it can't handle it. Um, the other thing that uh, sampling does affect, if I go from our material preview to our full-on rendered mode, we get our, obviously we get our shadows from our lights. Under our shadows here, we have a few options. We have soft shadows, which I can turn on and off. We have the size of the projection. So the way that a raster, um, a raster shadow is done is it basically uses the light as a, as a projector, like a camera. And, and goes, okay, from this perspective, 
what can I see? What can't I see? Anything I can see, I definitely uh, must be in, in light because I can see it. Anything I can't see must be in shadow because I can't see it. And so that's essentially the projecting method that um, shadows in a rasterization engine use. And because it's projecting this um, this shadow, it's projecting it as, at a certain resolution. Um, so you can change that resolution down if you're trying to save on performance. Obviously, 64 pixels per light is super low resolution. Um, and you can turn it up to like 4K per light, but you're still going to get that little bit of like an uh, aliased effect at the edges. So if I go, to, go down to 1024, you're still getting that stair-steppy effect. If I turn on soft shadows, um, Obviously, in the real world, um, you can diffuse a shadow. Shadows will kind of blur depending on how wide the light source is. Um, the soft shadow effect, how they accomplish it in Eevee, because it's raster, it's not ray traced, you can't actually um, trace the number of, of bounces of the light to create true soft shadows. You can kind of see here how it does it. As I move the camera, it does like a, uh, you can see everything kind of pop. And what it does is it does multiple projections of the light from slightly different positions and then tries to like blend them together to create like an overlapping blur to soften the shadows. And that's what the sampling for shadows does. As I turn up the number of samples, it does more and more of those projections from more and more angles. And so the blur, the com combined blur, becomes softer and softer um, and more more uh, high quality because you have more samples, more projections, but obviously that gets slower and slower because you're having to do more and more light projections um, as you change from, you know, 1 to 2 to 125 samples. Um, and then the last setting that we didn't, or the last common setting that we didn't touch on really quickly is Bloom. Bloom is that like glow effect that you get in cameras where uh, a really bright light is like scattering um, inside the lens. Um, kind of J.J. Abrams lens flare effect. Um, some people like it, some people don't. Um, I find in Eevee at least, the Bloom effect is a little bit um, overpowering. Even if you try to play around with like the radius and stuff, it doesn't look quite right to me um, just as an artistic preference. So I tend not to use it. If I'm going to add Bloom, I'll add it afterwards in like Photoshop or something. Um, but yeah. Going, all right, so that's pretty much everything that you use commonly inside of Eevee. There are some more advanced settings in there for volumetrics and hair and depth of field and stuff. We're going to ignore that. We're going to set that aside for now. We're going to go over to Cycles now. So, Cycles, as you can kind of see with all the noise in the viewport right now, Cycles is a true path tracing render engine, which means that it actually, um, from the camera's perspective, it will actually shoot out a bunch of photons of light and watch how they bounce around, trace light from, the, from your lamps in the scene, capture reflections from the photons bouncing around the scene, so you get true realistic reflections, true realistic lighting with a path tracing render engine. Um, and because Cycles is a uh, physically based render engine, it will actually um, create realistic results because every bounce of light, the photon of light is actually losing energy, so you get true um, lighting energy conservation in your scenes, um, which helps uh, elevate the realism in your scenes. Um, so if we go ahead and turn the floor into a mirror like we did last time, we can actually point out that, you know, as I uh, get up close to some of these metal objects, you know, the, the, green, uh, the green monkey is not in my camera view, but the reflections of the green monkey are definitely still in my camera view. Um, as I go and move the camera lower and lower, obviously from the camera view, I can't see the backside or the underside of Suzanne, but in the reflections, I definitely can see the backside and the underside of Suzanne. Um, so yeah, the, benef the benefits of path tracing is you get true, realistic results. The downside is it is much, much, much more computationally heavy and much, much, much slower compared to rasterization because of the process that it's using to get realism. For every pixel on the screen, 
Um, that's what this, this sample count means, is that for every pixel on the screen, it's sending out 64 photon samples. It's sampling 64 rays of light that it's then bouncing around the scene. And under light paths, we can see that, at least with my settings by default, I let that photon of light bounce three times. Um, but depending on what your settings are, that photon might bounce four, five, six, twenty times. Um, so you can imagine if you've got a a 1920 by 1080 image, which has you know that's almost two uh, million pixels on the screen. For each of those two million pixels, multiply that by however many samples by 128 samples. So you've got um, 256 million photons of light, and then multiply that by each of those lights rays are bouncing around, you know, two, three, six, seven, eight times around your scene, it becomes processor intensive very, very quickly. Um, so that's, that's the trade-off. Um, a path tracing engine gives you much, much more true to life, realistic results, you know, inherently, but you are trading off that performance impact. Now, GPUs can accelerate the performance up to a point that it is much more reasonable. And if you have a, a multi-core CPU, a highly multi-core CPU like the, uh, the modern Ryzen CPUs, where you have eight, 12 cores in a, in a relatively affordable CPU, um, it, it can become more and more processor. Um, uh, it can be more uh, attainable for people on lower end hardware to get um, decent performance out of cycles uh, and get reasonable render times that are still um, not you know overly uh, overwhelmingly tedious for you um, but it, it is a compromise you're definitely you're looking at you know a few seconds for an EV render versus potentially minutes or hours for a render out of cycles depending on your settings so You've got that balance. You got that balance of trade-offs. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and set my floor back from being a mirror back to being just kind of a flat floor, and I'm gonna take a sip of water. Um, so with with cycles, it is. On the one hand, the settings are a lot um, simpler. There's fewer of them because you're not worried so much about like adding extra passes of post-processing effects to your scene. You're only dealing with, you know, how many samples and how uh, many bounces for those samples. However, you, you can get into an entire rabbit hole with cycles in terms of how people prefer to like tweak their settings here, tweak their settings there to get a little bit more performance, but a little bit less realism, all that kind of stuff. Basically, as far as cycles goes, the things you worry about are what device you're using, CPU or GPU. Um, if you don't have GPU available to you, when you go to your preferences under system, make sure that you've got um, either CUDA or OpenCL enabled and check off that you're actually, um, that Blender is allowed to use your GPUs for um, rendering. Um, optics is something that's being implemented. It's currently kind of a work in progress in Blender. Optics is um, basically it takes advantage of RTX cards um, to do accelerated ray tracing with RTX hardware. Um, so if you have a modern um, 20 series uh, NVIDIA GPU, uh, maybe experiment with optics. As of 2.82, there are still some features in Blender which optics um, is not able to do. Um, so basically check, if, if you're checking on optics in the future, um, read up on how optics has been developed. You can see somewhere in the range of like 20 to 35% render time increases using optics. Um, and you also have available to you some like uh, AI denoising developed by Intel when you're using optics mode. Um, but it's currently um, still kind of in a beta phase. So I, I still use CUDA just because I need a few of those render features, which are currently unavailable in optics. Um, anyway, if you, if you have your device set to CPU, obviously it will be only using your CPU, which um, is generally a lot slower than GPU rendering. Um, whereas if you got it set to GPU compute, it will generally be a lot faster than CPU rendering. Um, so make sure you got your device set to the correct thing. Your sample settings here, you've got viewport samples, which is what you're seeing in the 3D view right now to get a quick preview of what your final render will be. And then your render settings, 
are when you hit F12 to do a full final render from your camera's perspective, it will use that sample number. So you can have uh, a quick, a low number of samples in your viewport to get quick previews, and then have a much higher uh, sample setting for your final renders to get that extra quality when you're ready to just hit F12 and then, you know, go get a cough, cup of coffee, come back, see if your render's finished, that kind of thing. Um, again, we're not going to get under advanced or any of these other, other things. Um, the only other setting I'll touch on briefly is over here under max bounces. Um, you can set the total number of bounces, the total max number of bounces for the light in your scene, and then separately change the number of bounces that are allowed for rays that are diffuse, uh, glossy, the reflections, transparency, transmission volume. Uh, in general, I set my total rays to three, um, and you can ignore my other ones because I've, I've tweaked those. Obviously, I've done advanced tweaking to get my, you know, what I find is a good balance of performance and, and realism. Um, I have my max bounces set to three simply because uh, in all of my testing that I've done, and I will go ahead and link a, an article in the description of the video where somebody else has a, a really good uh, demonstration, after three bounces of light, the energy of that photon of light has has um, diminished so much by by being um, ricocheted and losing energy that further bounces contribute negligibly to the overall final image quality. Um, so for the first couple of bounces of of, of lighting, um, it contributes a lot to your reflections and to like um, internal reflections. So like if I only had um, one bounce of light in the ears here. I'll go ahead and demonstrate this. If I turn down the number of bounces of light to like zero, obviously I get direct lighting, but I don't get any reflections. If I turn it up to one, I get one level of reflection. But if I have um, like if I have uh, recessed areas like in here where light would bounce multiple times, as I turn this up, you can see that the inside of Suzanne's mouth gets brighter because there are internal reflections where it would do that hall, it would do that uh, like hall of mirrors effect where you get light bouncing back and forth back and forth back and forth um, at two sam at two bounces um, you get those like extra internal reflections at three bounces you get a further level of reflections and indirect lighting beyond that unless you have like a hall of mirrors where you're definitely going to see a lot of internal reflections um, I find that the energy loss in those photons no longer justifies doing more and more and more bounces of light. You don't get appreciably more um, global illumination. You don't get appreciably more um, detail in your like recessed areas uh, if you have recesses like this. Um, I find three to be a good compromise, and that's like the only advi advanced advice I'll give in this like introduction to Blender is save yourself the headache, save yourself, save your CPU or your GPU, the, the rendering time, set that to three, and you should be fine for most circumstances. Um, and so now let's go ahead and touch on some of the lighting. So in, in the scene right now, I have two lights, two point lights set up. If I go down, if I select one of the light bulbs and go down to our properties to this little light bulb area, we see we have a number of options. We're just going to focus on just the light options right now. Um, so we could change the color of the light if we wanted to make it look like we've got some like disco gel on the light. Um, I don't like this, so I'm going to right click on it and hit uh, reset to default, just so it's a white, pure white light. Um, then we have power, size, and max bounces. Max bounces is kind of an advanced thing. You can set um, independently of your overall render settings. You can set certain lights to bounce fewer times than your render settings. So I could set this one lamp to, set, to bounce only once instead of three times or five times. Um, or I think by default 1024 is set as like an arbitrarily high number that no one would ever set their bounces to so it will bounce as many times as your render limit um, uh, but this is kind of an advanced thing you never really mess with the max bounces there you change your your render settings you don't change the per lamp settings unless you're really really super advanced trying to tweak the performance of your scene um, the size uh, you can kind of see around our light bulb here our lamp we have this little like 
circle. And that circle shows us how big the light is. So if I set this, scale this all the way down, it becomes like a mathematically infinitesimally small point light, a true point light emitting from one, you know, infinitely small point in space. And you can see that the result of that is we have super precisely sharp shadows. Um, in the real world, lights generally aren't infinitely small mathematically perfect points. They aren't black holes or anything like that. Um, like a light bulb with a diffuser will generally be, you know, like an inch and a half across. And so these being the sizes of mugs, if I set it to 0.04 meters, 4 centimeters, that'll be about an inch and a half across. And so that would be the size of a, of a light bulb. Um, and in this case, that softens up the shadows because instead of the light all coming from one direction, it's coming from multiple directions out of the size of that light bulb. And as we make the bulb bigger, the shadows become more and more soft because the light source is larger and larger. And so the light, the photons of light can come from more and more directions and kind of blur together and blend into that softer shadow. And then we get to the power setting for um, for our lights in Blender. Now, the point, spot, and area light all use watts. The sun lamp uses um, its own different value, which is watts per meter squared. Um, this is where it gets weird and sciency, and I kind of have to throw up my hands. Um, because Blender uses, um, you know, it does physically based rendering and it is, uh, it takes into account energy conservation of the light to make sure that you can't get, um, you know, additive light that you, you have a lamp that somehow puts out more light than is absorbed by the objects in the scenes. It's, it's physically a accurate. Um, the, under the hood, the light is actually treating uh, each photon with a certain amount of energy that then gets dissipated for every reflection as it's absorbed by the objects in the scene. Um, however, that wattage isn't useful in the way that you'd think it'd be useful. So uh, at a glance, you think, oh, 50 watts is like a 50 watt light bulb. Like if I had a 60 watt incandescent light bulb in my house, I would just put in 60 and it would match in Blender. That is not the case. Um, the reason that's not the case is because a 60 watt light bulb doesn't actually put out 60 watts of light. Um, incandescent light bulbs, as we know, are super, super inefficient because it turns most of the power from your wall into heat instead of light and energy. Um, which is why we changed over to fluorescent CFLs and then nowadays we're using LEDs because a an 8 watt LED light bulb can put out the same relative brightness of light as a 60 watt incandescent bulb because it's far more efficient and turns less of the energy from the wall into heat and more of it straight into brightness. Um, there are some videos out there from under-informed um, Blender users, so on YouTube um, and in a few of the Blender forums, where people are suggesting, oh, use this calculator to convert from lumens to watts. Don't do that. That doesn't work. Um, most render engines, um, like Unreal Engine, like uh, Unity, like like several other um, render engines out there, use lumens. And when you actually look at a box of light bulbs in the store, you will use lumens because lumens is a, a measurement of the um, perceived brightness of the light bulb independent of the efficiency of the light bulb technology. So an 800 lumen light bulb, a 60 watt incandescent light bulb is usually 800 or 900 lumens. So an 800 lumen incandescent light bulb will have the same perceived brightness as an 800 lumen LED bulb, even though one uses 60 watts because it's inefficient and one uses 8 watts because it is super efficient. The lumens are identical for the same perceived brightness. And that's the problem with a lot of people who suggest these tools of convert lumens into watts and then put the watts into Blender. Well, no, because that would mean that for the same lumens, a, an incandescent bulb would be brighter in Blender than a LED bulb because the LED bulb is more efficient. That's wrong. That is totally wrong. Ignore people who are suggesting that. They are 
confused and wrong. Um, unfortunately, the math behind the wattage of the power of a photon from a light bulb is confusing because you get into irradiance and luminance and candelas and flux and like candelas are measured in the amount of light per um, per angular area based on the apex angle of the l emitting light source and the lumens are based on the it gets really math mathy and confusing so this is one of those parts of blender where unfortunately uh, I hope that in future versions of, of, of 2.8 or perhaps 2.9 they go ahead and switch to lumens uh, because that is a far more universal and, and um, technology agnostic, uh, artist friendly um, lighting unit. Um, for now, it's kind of a case of set the lights to what looks good for your scene by eye and just tweak it by eye. Um, I have found that to get a fairly realistic result that is also um, artistically pleasing, your sun lamp should be somewhere in the range of 400, uh, power of 400 for like a bright mid-afternoon, whereas the power of your point, spot, and area lights should be somewhere in the range of like 40, 50, up to like maybe 100 um, to get like a realistic indoor light bulb look. That is completely independent of like the wattage of a light bulb. Don't, don't think in terms of wattage of a light bulb because light bulb technologies are different. Um, somewhere in the range of 40 to 100 for point lights and spot lights is fairly realistic and basically tweak it by eye to what looks good in your scene. So, setting that discussion aside, uh, point lights, obviously, they po they uh, project light in every uniformly in every direction. A spotlight has a cone that focuses light as if it was, you know, a spotlight or maybe like a lamp with a lampshade. And you can change the uh, angle of that spot size under the spot shape and like feather the edges of it using this blend size to make it either like a super sharp or a super um, like diffused bulb on the on the spotlight. An area light um, is good for simulating like uh, ceiling panels or lights from like a, a LCD monitor or a TV because they are kind of big rectangular or big evenly shaped, evenly lit. Um, illuminating objects. It is still single-sided, so if I move this area light uh, forward and maybe hide this one, you can see that as I rotate this, it doesn't light behind itself, it lights in front of itself, and the line projecting from the area lamp shows you which direction the lamp is facing. Um, let me go ahead and unhide these objects in my scene. So it still has a direction, but it also has a size, and that size can be square, rectangular, or elliptical. Um, and so this is really good for, like, yeah, drop drop ceiling lights, like uh, fluorescent light panels in offices and schools, or um, LCD monitors, or perhaps if you had, like, a uh, an indoor scene where you had a window with a curtain, you might just use an area light to fake the, the very diffused, even lighting coming through the curtain. Um, that's another option instead of having to actually use um, really heavy translucency effects to try to like simulate it um, realistically, you could sort of fake it with a with an area light. Um, and then the sun lamp uh, projects light basically from infinity in a parallel direction. Um, you can change the angle there to make softer um, shadows, like if the sun was coming through clouds, but um, yeah, so so a, a spot a sun lamp doesn't have it's not single sided like a spotlight or an area light. It just projects light basically from infinity in a direction constantly, consistently. Um, so now we've gone over our render engines, we've gone over our lights. Now we'll get into the materials a little bit more in depth than we did in the uh, the last one. So I select one of my Suzanne's here and go back to her materials. We'll go to the surfaces. 
So we touched on this a little bit when we mentioned that Cycles and EV are physically based render engines. And what this means is um, the PBR approach to lighting is an industry standard. Um, the whole idea with um, modern lighting, uh, modern shading models is to approximate how photons actually interact with the real surfaces in the real world. Um, and the, the current level of, of, of uh, research uh, into computer graphics is using a micro facet model, which basically treats surfaces as if they are either completely and perfectly smooth mirrors, or you can imagine taking um, sandpaper to that mirror and scuffing it up, and the reflections would go from being really perfect reflections to being really um, blurry and scattered, because now there's a bunch of little uh, micro scratches in the surface, or micro facet detail in the surface that then blurs and, and ruins the, the shiny, perfect reflectivity of that surface. Um, the, if you add a material to a new object in Blender, so I'll go ahead and add a, uh, not a circle, let's add a sphere. Let's add a sphere to my scene, scale it down, set it to smooth shading mode, and I'll add a new material. When you add a new material to an object in Blender, it will set that uh, surface to be using the principled BSDF shader by default. Now there are other shaders in Blender for um, glass, for hair, for um, volumetrics and things. We're not going to get too much in detail with those advanced shaders. We're going to stick to the principal shader. And the principal shader, for most circumstances, is all you're ever going to need because it is like a one-stop shop, one-size-fits-all, good-for-most-situations kind of shader. The principled uh, shader here is based on a paper from Pixar in 2012 where they were... Um, what Pixar was trying to accomplish was to make their movies more and more um, visually appealing, and visually appealing things um, in uh, graphics technology is essentially more and more real world. Um, having better reflections, better lighting, um, things that look less like weird plastically waxy stuff, like old, like the old Tinker Toy or the old Toy Story, you know, heading towards the modern day where you've got your modern um, up or uh, uh, the newer Toy Story, Toy Story 4 and stuff. You can you can kind of see like from Toy Story 1 to Toy Story 4 the development of graphics technology over that period and how lighting and shading and reflections has improved over time. Um, the reason the modern movies look so much better is even though they are still stylized, they use um, realistic lighting to achieve that stylization. Um, and so what Disney was trying to do was create an approach for creating um, realistic materials that um, are fundamentally based in how light actually interacts with real materials in the real world, but then taking a an approach that is um, simplified and abstracted for artists. So it's easier for artists to, instead of having to deal with all the, the physics and the math and the numbers of, of how photons interact. You can just tweak a couple sliders and all the you know fancy math stuff is handled under the hood and the artist can focus on artistic principles. And that's what the principled approach, a principled shader is, is an artist's principled approach to physically based rendering. Um, I will link in the description a link to the Pixar paper from 2012 and I'll also include a couple papers from uh, Elegrhythmic, who developed the Substance Texturing Painting software, which are super good at um, giving an overview and an introduction to PBR shading, um, the physics behind it, as well as the uh, artistic approach to using a metal roughness PBR shading approach. Um, so in uh, Blender, using the principal shader, there's basically three settings that you use by default most of the time, and then some advanced ones beyond that. So the default one, the, the three basic ones are your base color, your metalness, and your roughness. So your base color is basically what it sounds like. As I move this, this slider around, it changes the underlying co color for our object. Um, and to save on performance right now, I'm actually going to go back to my material preview mode, because it's a lot, um, a lot more lightweight to render with that. A lot faster. So 
our base color is exactly what it sounds like. It's the underlying color of our surface. Our metalness is basically a slider that says uh, at zero, this is not a metal. At one, this is a metal. Um, a non-metal, like a plastic or a rubber or a wood, um, is called a dielectric material, and the metallic, uh, a metal is an electric material, a, a conductive material. Um, and the reason that these look different, um, the basic way to think about it is a dielectric material uh, doesn't tint its reflections. The reflections off the surface, like you can see the, the underlying blue of the plasticky Suzanne here is blue, but the reflections are still like the regular colors of the world around it. So you've got white reflections of the white surfaces, the red still shows up red for the uh, like sofa in the background there. Whereas... If I were to turn this into a metal, suddenly those reflections become like tinted by the color of the underlying metal because of the way that the photons interact. Again, not getting into the super in-depth mathy bits, but that's kind of the way to think about it. Metals interact with reflections differently to non-metals, so there's a slider there to say, is this metal, is this not metal, make it look like a metal. Uh, and then our roughness slider is, like I was saying, you've got a mirror, you take sandpaper to the mirror and rough it up, and it makes it less less um, shiny, more blurry, and that's what this is. The roughness is either completely shiny, not rough, or very, very blurry, very scratched off, very rough, not shiny. Um, and so that slider basically lets you pick between the two extremes. Um, you can find uh, examples in the documents in the... Uh, the PDFs that I'll link in the description, there are examples of like um, measured roughness values for certain materials, certain common materials in the real world, like certain metals and certain um, fabrics and things. And you can go online and Google and try to find like um, average roughness values for certain materials, but a lot of this is playing around artistically by eye. It's not you know super precise in that way, but you can kind of tweak between does this look shiny enough, does this look not shiny enough, and just figure out what works for you in your situation. Um, there are a few other sliders in here which do slightly advanced things. Um, we're not going to get into all of these because, again, advanced stuff. Um, the one I will mention, which is demonstrated by Suzanne at the end here, and I'll go ahead and turn back to my sh uh, rendered mode to really show this off, is subsurface. So I turn this off, we have a flat, like, flesh tone Suzanne, or like a waxy Suzanne. And if I go to the back side, you can see that none of the light from these lamps is passing through the object because she's solid. However, in the real world, there are plenty of materials that allow light to pass through it. So if you've ever done um, like shadow puppets where you shine a light on one side of a blanket and hold up your hand and the shadows cast through the blanket, um, or you've ever held up a flashlight to the palm of your hand and seen like the red glow as the, as the light glows through your skin, um, you can hold up a flashlight to, to wax candles or to milk or, you know, there are plenty of materials in the real world. Porcelain as well, which are translucent, not tran or not opaque or not tran fully transparent. And so what subsurface is, is subsurface scattering is um, basically a, a property that defines how much light is actually allowed to enter into the surface, pass through the surface, and get diffused like that flashlight through skin. Um, so as I turn this slider up, you'll see that more and more of the light from our lamp is passing through and glowing, and you can see it's got this kind of um, pinky, orangey, yellowy color, um, which makes it look a lot like skin. By default, the principal shader has these radi uh, radius settings set to 1, 2, and 0.1. Essentially, these radiuses are RGB, and it's saying how much each color is being scattered through the surface. So red is being scattered a lot. Uh, G, the green, is being scattered um, a decent amount. And blue isn't being scattered much at all. Um, so you can kind of see that's why we have our kind of yellowy green here. Um, we have lots of red, lots of yellowy green, and a tiny bit of blue being scattered as well. Um, and the reason it's set by to this by default is most of the time when you're doing subsurface scattering, it's because you're doing it on flesh of characters. You're doing, you know, humans and things. Um, so we could set these all to, like, all of these to one, and then the scattering would just be defined by this subsurface color, which would be white, or red, or green, or blue. Or, 
you know, we could change it so that there's no green and no blue being scattered. It's only red being scattered, or only green being scattered, or only blue being scattered. Um, the defaults of 1, 0.2, and 0.1 are designed to make it look as quickly as possible, pretty much like skin. Um, and it does a decent job of doing that. Um, so from the front side, you can see that um, it makes things a little bit softer, a little bit more waxy looking. As we turn up the slider, it becomes much more waxy looking. Um, and then from the back side, obviously, you get more and more light being able, being allowed to uh, transfer deeper and deeper and deeper through the surface, scatter further and further and further through the surface to make it look like it's either a larger or smaller amount of flesh or what have you, and light is allowed to pass through it uh, more or less easily. Um, and those are pretty much all the settings I'm going to touch on for now. Um, a lot of the other advanced sliders you don't need to worry about unless you're doing really advanced um, specific material tweaking. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much the overview of everything we wanted to cover this week. Um, Again, it probably got sidetracked in a few places as we were going to, as we were kind of discussing um, some of the advanced things that you can get into when you start talking about um, all of these issues of rendering and, and light physics and, and, and proper realistic shading. Um, the basic idea is you apply a principled shader to your object, you tweak base color, you tweak your metalness, you tweak your roughness, you make it look pretty much correct. You add lights to your scene and tweak them to the brightness values that you feel are um, best looking and appropriate for your scene. Uh, and then uh, from there, you can go ahead and change your render engine and tweak a few settings depending on what you need. If you have a low-end laptop or you're doing a quick preview and you need something to render fast, use Eevee. Turn on a few of those settings like ambient occlusion and screen space reflections to make it look slightly better. Um, you know, tweak your shadows and your samples to make them slightly softer and, and look a little bit better. Um, if you want full-on, as realistic as you can get out of the box of Blender, use cycles. Use a decent number of samples so it doesn't look too noisy. Um, don't bother with more than three bounces because you really aren't getting any benefit except just wasting render time on, on those extra bounces. Um, and that will get you pretty much started on the basics of light rendering and materials inside a blender. Um, actually, one last thing, checking my notes, that I did want to touch on was how do we, at, you know, because we're tweaking all these lights by eye, how do we know um, if our lighting is good or not, you know, if we're, if we're overexposed or not? Because we mentioned that um, with our, if we were to add an HDR map, we wanted, or if we're dealing with real cameras in the real world, it's easy for a camera to get blown out. And in Blender, you definitely can blow out the, light, the lighting. So if I turn this up to 5,000, you can see that the lighting is so overblown that everything's white and you lose all of your detail. Um, turn it back to 50, you keep your detail. It doesn't all, you know, blow out to white. So how do you know if you've got good realistic exposure? You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a photographer. I want my exposure to be, to be correct. How do we do that? If we go over to our render properties, and this is the same for Cycles and Eevee, we, in both render engines, we have this color management mode. Under View Transform, we have uh, Filmic set by default. There are a few of them in here. We can set it to RAW, we can set it to Log, we can set it to Filmic. Um, if you are a photographer or a videographer, if you're familiar with um, different uh, LUTs that you can apply to your camera, you can either have um, out of your camera, you can have it set to a, a log color profile, like red log or V log or C log, depending on your camera. Um, that logarithmic curve gives you a really washed out image, but gives you full dynamic range and lots of customization when you go to color grade later. Um, whereas if you were to use like a standard color profile, it would compress your color, your dynamic range and give you, um, you know, as you snap the photo, it might look more saturated and perfect and doesn't require you to color grade, but you're losing dynamic range. So by default, Blender is using the filmic mode, um, which is, 
basically a log mode with a little bit of saturation added in so it looks pretty good but but preserves your dynamic range um, however under view transforms one of those is false color and false color lets you see your exposure in in the viewport so if, if you've never used a false color mode like you've never used a, a cinema camera with false colors or a high-end photo camera with false colors basically you can think of it as a heat map that shows you your exposures levels green and gray are good and then as you get colder into your blues and purples and blacks that's underexposed as you get brighter into your, or warmer into your yellows and reds and whites that's overexposed so you can see that for if I switch back to filmic obviously um, the white ground and the very pale uh, Suzanne here are going to be a little bit overblown because the light is really close to Suzanne and her skin tone is very very pale um, whereas the uh, Suzanne heads that are in the middle which are a darker color and less shiny and farther from the light are more uh, are better exposed so if I go to my false colors you can see that the side of Suzanne that is facing the light and closest to the light and the side of the uh, floor here which is closest to the light is starting to get a little bit overexposed it's not fully overexposed but it's getting there and then the ones in the middle are very nicely exposed and if we wanted to tweak this we just change our exposure setting so if I go to my filmic and turn the exposure up and down we can see it's it's like changing um, an exposure setting in um, in our camera and as we go to our false color you can see that as we turn it down things start getting blue and black as we start underexposing our image losing dynamic range as we turn it up we start overexposing the image blowing out our highlights go back to filmic obviously we've blown out all these areas they're pure white we lose all our detail as we bring it back we can go the other way and suddenly things start compressing to black we're starting to crush our detail and lose detail in the shadows instead of our highlights and then if we leave it in the middle at one or at zero that'll be our normal exposure and it will depend on us making sure that our lighting matches a normal exposure so in our false colors I can go ahead and say uh, maybe the maybe the lights are a little bit bright maybe if I turn these down to like 25 that will mean that um, the ones in the middle are starting to become less exposed less nicely exposed the ones on the end here because they're metals reflecting a gray background they're really looking underexposed um, but suddenly now over here we're not as overexposed obviously Suzanne being pale right next to the light she's still a little bit overexposed but that's a lot better um, so that's how you get good exposure in Blender, even though we don't know the lumens, even though we can't actually set up good real-world physical lighting, um, we can still make sure that our exposure um, is good and doesn't overexpose our image, um, doesn't have a too high of a dynamic range for our um, virtual camera to capture properly. So, almost forgot to mention that, um, but I just I did want to quickly point that out that even though our lights are a little bit abstract, a little bit you know do it by eye, you can still use um, false colors to get a good idea of your real world exposure, like you would do on your cinema cameras. Um, and even when you render your final image, I'll go ahead and hit render here and render an image. Um, the focus on my camera is way far off, but that's fine. Um, if we open up the little side panel here using the little carrot in the corner and go down to scopes we even have um, histograms and waveforms so we can actually in our final image we can check our exposures much like we would do in Photoshop or much like we would do on a histogram on our camera so Blender does have a lot of advanced options for people who are trying to get their exposures correct or who come from a cinematography or photography background um, but that's as far as I'm going to get into it for this week um, so yeah, this one might have been a little bit boring, a little bit information heavy, but this was just a, like a quick overview of rendering, lighting, and materials in Blender. Basically, how to make things look good. How do you deal with the looks of things in Blender? Um, in our next few lessons, we'll start to get into uh, other areas of Blender. We'll get into things like physics simulations, animations, um, all that kind of stuff. But so far, we've now covered uh, the basics of rendering, 
the basics of modeling. Um, and in workshops two and three, we kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but we got into like advanced topics of um, modeling and texturing for games. Um, so yeah, hope this was useful to anybody. If we have any questions um, after the recording session, I'll go ahead and do a Q&A on the uh, WebEx live show for anybody who's maybe got lost or maybe wants to get some clarification on things. But for the archive, I'll go ahead and say goodbye now. Cut the video here.